day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We've been waiting on you. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Remember what Paul has, started, has begun in teaching in this 10th chapter. He says, hey, we're not warring against the power of the arm necessarily. This war that we're warring in is against principalities and powers in um, high places, meaning Satan himself, and some of, some of the bad spirits. And there had been a bunch of super preachers showing up on the scene, and Paul is kind of getting back now because of the super preachers about who they should listen to, in as much especially as Paul began the church here at Corinth, he knows that he first took the message of the Lord Jesus Christ there, and after having left the area, we got a bunch of these 90-day wonders that became super preachers overnight, just about. So Paul, is uh, he has apologized for writing a strong letter, but he said, hey, if I was there in person, I'd, I'd come down on you just as hard. If you're messing up, you're messing up, all right? But he said, I do love you, and I'm glad I had that real good report back from Titus. So with that having been said, he continues now. We're going to be on the case of the super preachers here for basically through this lecture. And Paul will pick it up as we ask a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Uh, let's go with it. Chapter 10, verse 12, that being the setting, and it reads, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. Got that? That means brags on themselves. Compares themselves with oneself. Saying, I, you know, stuff like, I'm the greatest and I know it because I am the greatest. In other words, to compare yourself as uh, a teacher of God's word, you have to go to the chief teacher and compare yourself to him. That is to say, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you compare yourself to him, you know that you know you've got a long ways to go. So Paul's talking about a special people here that compare themselves to themselves. One upmanship, it's called, oh, I talked to God today. That's usually their byline, and one looked over, I talked to him too. They're pulling your leg, all right? The Spirit gives unction, but anyway, but we continue. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise, and they're certainly not. It is real sad that preachers will, uh, you might say, well, do, doesn't God really talk to them? Not the way they're trying to play one-upmanship to the lay person, saying, that man must be really special. God must talk to him, tells him where to go buy his ice cream. Now, let me tell you, coming out the gate, God doesn't do that. When somebody tells you these little trivial things through the day that God spoke to me, I'm going to tell you, God speaks to you all right, but it's not a light thing. It is also true that the Holy Spirit will give you unction, but that's not God talking to you in the sense that they try to lay it on the layperson to make them think, oh, he must be a super preacher. God talked to him all the time. That doesn't happen. God speaks, you bet. And usually, if he actually speaks to you, it's not something you're going to repeat even. It's instruction. And it would break the average person up if they were to tell about it in the first place. Enough said. Let it go at that. Verse 13, we continue. But we will not boast of things without our measure. But according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. Now the word measure as it's used in this verse is two separate Greek words. One is immeasurable and the other is, is to mete out or metal to, um, to uh, compare thereto. Uh, but um, actually it's the plan, it's your sphere. Okay? What, what do you measure yourself against? Always let it be God's word. I'm going to tell you something. If you start looking at man to follow, you're in trouble. I want you to know man 
will always let you down in one form or the other, in this way or the other. Why? There's no perfect man, not this man or any other man. You are taught through the gospel, the plan, the same one that Paul brought to follow Jesus Christ, not man. Okay? So I, I just want to add this to get, let's get it straight in our minds coming out the gate about this measuring or comparing men. They're all going to fall short. All right? Only focus and keep your eye on God's plan and you'll you will uh, never go wrong. But when you start looking at man to lead you, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. I, I, I might say a little more on that. It would seem that we live in a generation of instant this and instant that. Every, everybody wants everything handed to them on a platter. They want their, uh, they, never, they don't think for themselves, and that's my beef, that people will not think for themselves. They want their lawyer to work out their problems. It's all right to seek advice, but then you make your own mind up. You pay him for the advice. That's all he is, is, you know, to give you the legal uh, precedents that have been set forth, and then you make your own mind up. Or they will let their preacher be the total and the one and only under God interpreter of God's word and do their thinking for them. You're in trouble, friend. God gave you a beautiful thing. It's called a mind. And you need to exercise it. You need to think for yourself. Anytime you affiliate, join, I don't care what the name is over the door, a group that wants to do your thinking for you will not allow you to question. You're in a cult. I don't care if it's one of the number one denominations in the country. If you feel you've got to be spoon-fed and you can't dare kick this little old thing up here called your brain and gear and think for yourself, then you're in a heap of hurt. You're probably not going to make it without being deceived. So. Let's just get that straight. Open up your mind. Exercise it. Train it. Think for yourself. Seek advice, well and good. But when you do seek advice, don't take it from the whittler's bench down on the corner. They've got advice rolling off all the time, and they know nothing, not a zippo, because they don't amount to anything. You go to a successful person, to ask advice, somebody that's been there, done that, and succeeded at it, all right? Think for yourself and learn to decide for yourself whereby you follow Christ. Learn to handle the word for yourself. Any good teacher is going to tell you and teach you how to accomplish that and let always your rule be the Father's plan, rule which God has, let's, let's go with the next verse. What verse are we to here? 14, but the one we just finished, rule with God hath distributed to us a measure to reach even unto you. Go by God's plan. Stick with it. Think on it. Learn how to use it for yourself. Verse 14, for we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reach not unto you. Remember, we were the first ones there. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. In other words, <clears throat> we were the first ones there. We brought this plan to you, and, and we were hoping that you would uh, absorb it to the point that you could take it on past where you are. That's the way Christianity grows. That's the way a ministry grows, is by uh, the members themselves taking the word, by word of mouth if necessary, whatever, to a friend, to a relative or something, when they learn the truth to uh, pass it on. Verse 15, not boasting of things without our measure. That's with, without, on the outside of our sphere, we don't say anything about that. That is, of other men's labors, but having hope 
when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. Um, enlarged is uh, migaland in the Greek. It means to, to really uh, uh, to um, magnify. Uh, to Migalin, to, to increase certainly. What? By the Spirit itself, allowing the Spirit to work among the people by carrying forth that truth. You know, we receive more letters from people who say, you have changed our lives. Well, I haven't changed anyone's lives. God's Word has. God's Word will do that. God's Spirit is powerful. It, I mean, it gets it done. So don't, don't worry about man's work. You take that truth and invest it. By that I mean share it with a loved one when they're in trouble and need help. And that word will magnify, it will expand, it will continue pushing until as the parable of the leaven of the whole loaf, it's leaven, 16. To preach the gospel in to evangelize in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. Uh, this is probably the greatest weakness of Christianity is uh, to, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. Uh, to, the Greek word to preach is to evangelize, would probably be better translated that, evangelu in the Greek. It means teach salvation. And once that whole pack is saved, they'll send in another evangelist where somebody else has already been there and they're all saved and preach salvation all over again. Well, you know, by the time you've been a Christian for 30 years, that gets a little old. That doesn't take away from the beauty of salvation. But somewhere along the way, to keep from starving, you've got to have a little bit of meat. So you need a teacher to teach. One plants, one reaps, one sows, one waters, and so forth. Okay? But um, uh, we have too much. Paul said it's like... In Hebrews chapter 5, Paul says it's like you try to re-crucify Christ all over again. You say, i got to get saved again when what you need to do is repent because there's only one salvation, and that's Jesus Christ. And if you say he failed his part, that's blasphemy. You're the one that falls short. Once you're saved, you repent, and you better get to it when you need it if you expect God's blessings. So stop tromping over the same ground over and over with uh, salvation, evangelizing, and get teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Okay, let's go to the next verse, verse 17. But he that glorieth or boasts, let him glory in the Lord. Let the Lord have the credit for it. It's his Word. It's his Spirit that touches, that raises, that heals, that magnifies, that expands. We're just servants. Verse 18. For not he that commendeth himself is approved. You can, you can commend yourself. You can talk about your doctorates. You can talk about your degrees. You can talk about anything you want to about yourself. But uh, you can't pass approval on yourself. You know why? But whom the Lord commendeth. It's who the Lord lifts up. That's what makes the difference. Because when the Lord lifts someone up, with it comes the blessings and the gifts that do change, that change people's lives, that will pull families off drugs and put them in a, in a uh, safe, comfortable Christian uh, home. In other words, it turns their home into a rich Christian heritage for those that uh, continue in it. Why? Because they're in the Word. When God gives you approval, it shows. You don't have to ask someone. You don't have to tell them. They know because you've got it. It what? God's blessings. God's approval. God's plan. And you don't have to tell someone. It shines like a neon sign. I would prefer God's commend commendation any day 
to a string of um, man's credentials a mile long because God's credentials gives you power. It gets things done. And it's real simple because it's always simply God's plan. He has this plan. He doesn't have another plan. This is it. This is the way it's going to be. It's simple. Stick with it. Focus on it. And you will always get ahead. Follow man and you'll end up in the ditch because often known, that's where they all end up. We all trip, fall, and that's what repentance, the most beautiful thing about Christianity, is to repent, get your act together, and serve God. Chapter 11, verse 1. He's not going to ease off here on the super preachers. Verse 1 reads, Would to God, the word to God is not in the original manuscripts. It's Hebraism, kind of like I, I wish to God, okay? Be that as it may. You could bear with me a little in my folly. And indeed, bear with me. I, I want to tell you what's really in my heart about this situation. I want to tell you what's really bothering me about it. That's what Paul is saying. It's why I'm giving you such a lecture on other preachers, other messages. It's, this, is, this is what is really at the core of it. So you better pay attention. Because probably the most dangerous thing in the world to a Christian will be discussed. Verse 2. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Now, not, not a man's jealousy, but I'm jealous over you just like God is. Why? He was their godfather, so to speak, because he had brought them into... The, he was their spiritual father. Let's put it that way. For I have espoused, do you know what the word espoused means? I have engaged you for the purpose of marriage. Uh, I've espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, uh, that, that isn't difficult. I think all of you know how you lose your virginity. I think all of you know how that um, uh, an espousal, a dedication, a, an engagement, and what the outcome is, it's supposed to be a marriage. Okay? I mean, that, that's just simple stuff that you uh, experience in your own life if you're, if you're blessed. But he said, spiritually, this is what I'm worried for you about. I'm really afraid as a Christian, you're in trouble if you don't recognize these things. You listen to these super preachers and they pull you away from the simplicity that is in God's word. Verse 3, but I fear lest by any means, by some way or another, as the serpent, that's the old devil, the dragon, Satan, Lucifer, whatever name you want to call him, serpent, beguiled Eve. Do you know what the word beguiled is? Exclatio. I'll, I'll show it to you in the Greek in a moment. He did what to Eve? Beguiled through his subtlety, his slickness. So your minds, what is it? Your mind, that thing you think with. Your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, this is really Paul's uh, being very blunt, and he's pulling this right down where the rubber meets the road. And he says, I don't want you to be deceived, because I've got you set aside for one husband, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, not the serpent, not the devil. I want to make sure you make it. Now, what, what is this word beguile? Pull it up on the Greek, 1818 in your Greek dictionary of your Strong's Concordance. It is made up from 1537 and, and uh, 538. You can, to seduce wholly. That's the only meaning. I, I don't have to tell you what to seduce wholly means. That's simple. That's how you lose your virginity. And that's what Paul is afraid of. Paul is afraid 
that before the Lord Jesus Christ returns and that wedding takes place, that some are going to fall off. And what's going to happen? Well, Christ himself would teach, and we're going to go there, Mark 13. You can, Mark chapter 13. What, what is this 13th chapter of Mark about? Well, it's when Jesus was gathered together with the uh, disciples, and they asked him, what's it going to be like just when you return at the second advent? And um, he told them how that the false Messiah would come first and many would fall off and jump in the sack with him by deception or however you want to put it. The word beguile puts it right down where the rubber meets the road. As Paul would teach you in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm sorry, chapter 11 verse 10, that a woman had better keep her head covered because of the angels. And that covering is the veil of Christ, the husband we're all espoused to as the bride. Because Michael's going to kick the, fa the fallen angels out of heaven again along with Satan. Revelation chapter 12 verse 7 documents that. <clears throat> you don't want to know what he's really concerned about? I mean, he's talking pretty plain. I'm going to pick it up here in Mark 13 verse 17. We're going to read a few verses. Jesus says, when I get back, he gave seven things that would be, which are the seven seals, the seven trumpets. It's not difficult for one to understand the seven trumpets. All you got to do is know Matthew 24 and Mark 13, and you, they're no mystery to you. You're not ignorant any longer. You know what they mean. This happens to be one of them. Verse 17 of Mark 13. But woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Well, now let's think on this. How is it that you get with child? Come on, come with me. I'm just saying I don't want you to, I don't want you to slip out from under the rug here. I want you to look at the truth square on. And to them that give suck in those days. What days? The days he returns when the wedding is supposed to be. What it is, and he makes it very simple. If the husband or the, the bridegroom has been away from 2,000 years and he returns and you're carrying a small child, a suckling child in your arms and giving suck, meaning even nursing along Satan's work, there's been some hanky-panky. He had a reason for being jealous. Well, uh, for goodness sakes, as a Christian, I never heard my pastor say that the false Christ would come first to this way. Well, he hasn't taught you the word of God then. Shame on him. To give suck simply means to nurse, not only accept Satan when he comes as the false Christ to think it is the true husband that Paul has espoused you to, but to jump in the sack with him and produce fruit for Satan's camp. Boy, that's a real mess for a Christian to catch themselves in, isn't it? it there is no more sin or disgrace in a mother giving birth in a natural birth. God commended it. God loved it. It's the natural thing to do. It's the blessed thing to do. But we're talking here about a spiritual birth. When you are espoused to one husband <clears throat> by allowing yourself to be deceived by the false Messiah. Well, did Jesus teach there would be a false Messiah come first? You bet he did. Haven't you ever read the Bible? Let's continue right on with it. Verse 18, and pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. What does that mean? Well, when is harvest? It's certainly not in the winter time. Meaning, don't get harvested out of season. Don't get plucked off the tree at the wrong time of the year. 19. For in those days shall be affliction. That's tribulation. People, where are you going to be in the tribulation? A lot of you are not even going to know it's going on. It's the greatest tent revival this world will have ever seen. Only the chief preacher is the Messiah fake. Such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created into this time, neither shall be. You got some of these ignoramuses running around saying, 
Well, this all happened when Titus marched into Jerusalem. Did you read that verse? Or you wouldn't be ignorant enough to make that statement. And I'm talking real plain because I mean it. It's serious. It's like Paul said, do you want to be deceived? Don't listen to some nut, freako, unlearned, incompetent, so-called man of God, super preacher, that would tell you this came to pass with Titus, a little tin horn Roman general, that it would be the greatest affliction and tribulation from time beginning until now, because that is the height of, uh, well, I won't say it again. You know that. Verse 20. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. Why? He's slick, friend. Satan's snapping fingers causing lightning to come from heaven. That's scriptural. I can document it. <clears throat> it's real simple. Revelation 13, beginning with verse 14. But for the elect's sake, do you know who the elects are? That's those that overcame at Satan's first rebellion. For their sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days to a five-month period, as it's written in, Re in Revelation chapter 9, verse 21. And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. What is Christ talking about? The false Christ will be here. That's what he's teaching. Well, I've never heard my preacher say that. Shame on him. It's one of the most dangerous thing in this generation to Christianity is the fake comes first saying, I've come to rapture you out of here. And they'll jump in the sack with him in mass. Shame that the ministry has not taught God's word to those that trusted them to teach God's word. It's no excuse. God will still hold the individual responsible because the letter was written personally to you. <clears throat> A child can understand this. Can you? I'm not, I, I'm not talking down to you. I'm just saying it's time to wake up. And you can understand why Paul said, I want to clear my heart. I want to tell you something. Verse 22. Let's see if this makes sense to you. For false Christ and, prof and false prophets shall rise. That means they're coming and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. You know, it doesn't take much of a superstar to drive people nuts in this generation. I mean, they'll follow anything. Think what a supernatural, actual, de facto here on earth will do when Satan and his little super dudes are kicked out to the earth. Do you have to worry? Verse 23, but take ye heed. That means you be very careful. Behold, I have foretold you all things. He's warned us what's going to happen. Why will people not read it? Again, a child can understand. Not, not that big a deal. So simple. Okay, let's continue on back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> Do you want me to recap that? Paul said, I'm really nervous about it. I don't want the same thing to happen to you that happened to Eve. Do you know when that happened? Have you ever read Genesis 3 when Christ would say in... Um, that, um, well, you mean when she ate the apple? The word apple is not there. It's not in Eve's garden. It's the serpent, the same old serpent, who wholly seduced her. That is why God would say in Revel Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, that uh, I will put enmity between thy seed and the seed of the woman. Why? Because of the fact that she was, um, the conception had taken place. Do you know what conception is? A child could understand. So uh, he said, I'm afraid that's going to happen to you when the false Christ returns. Verse 4, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 
Verse 4 reads, For if he that cometh, one of these fake preachers, one that cometh, preaching, preacheth another Jesus, other than Emmanuel, whom we have not preached. If he preached you a gospel we haven't preached. Or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received while we preached. Or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with it. You'll, what this really is, I'm going to interpret it the way it should be. You'll swallow it hook, line, and sinker. Some super preacher comes along and blah, 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 blah. You'll take it all and say, oh, glory! And be ignorant of God's word and what will actually happen. It's real sad to be led down Primrose Lane in high gear and a spiritual high. There's just one thing, it's Satan's spirit that takes them. You want to be real careful, my friend. That's what Paul is saying. It's very simple what happens in the end times. And he said, they bring this stuff to you. Oh, I think the latest is the laughing church. You're going to laugh yourself all the way to hell. Isn't that intelligent? I mean, you know, think about this generation. That is really intelligent. Y any child knows if you've ever had a slumber party or anything like that when you get the giggles, all right? That spirit, come on, wake up before it's too late. And I, I don't normally talk against churches, but I mean, after all, where are we going to draw the line to fakes? Ho, 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 ho. Good heavens above. Swallow it, hook, line, and sinker. That they do. Verse 5. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. Uh, they, 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 um, uh, I, would, I won't take a back seat to anybody teaching God's word. That's what Paul says. Apostle is one sent forth by God himself. He said, I'm not taking a back seat. Paul was a little crude. Paul practiced tough love. He talked tough because he had to, to get to the truth. I mean, after all, what was taking place in this place, the first letter when he wrote that scathing letter, there was an incestuous affair taking place right in the church. What did you expect from him? To say, nothing, no, 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 naughty, naughty. That's what some powder puff, panty-laced preacher might say. Be nice. No, Paul told him what to do about it. Verse 6. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. We have proved ourselves to you over and over and over by the deeds that were done there, the healings, the uh, teachings, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I have nothing more to say about it that Paul would state as far as proving. Now, Paul, the reason he would say he was rude, he spoke colloquial Greek. His education came in Roman, Latin, that is to say, but primarily Hebrew. He was a Hebrew scholar. And the Greek he spoke is what you and I, well, what, can I, what analogy can I use? Do you know what uh, border Spanish is? Now that that's Spanish that has a lot of English mixed into it, kind of a get-by language, okay? Well, colloquialism, many times uh, we that uh, are public speakers, we will switch colloquialism to be up to speed in the area in which we're talking, speaking, whereby we can reach the people because you can communicate better with them if you use their colloquialism. And, uh, and you are accepted more readily by them if you can uh, use the dialect and the colloquialism in which they actually are. Now it's very difficult for one of us Southerns when, Southerners when we get up to Minnesota or somewhere up that far north, uh, we're pretty, it's pretty tough to switch colloquialisms then. But be that as it may, uh, Paul spoke street Greek. And that come off a little bit rough sometimes, I suppose. But boy, his knowledge 
would top them all. Peter himself would give credentials in 2 Peter chapter 3, along about verse uh, 13 and 14. He would say, even the learned wrestle with the teachings of Paul, the mysteries that he brings forth, if you'll listen to him. Well, that's what I want you to do is listen to the teachings of Paul, for they're not even Paul's teachings. When he said he was an apostle, that means sent forth. Who does the sending? God does. He was a teacher of God's very thought, so listen to your father, almighty God. When he warns you about what's going to happen, what's going to transpire in this final generation, which is the generation of the fig tree. Well, well, what's the generation of the fig tree? The generation that would be living when Israel would become a nation again, it began in the year of our Lord, 1948. Where were you? It's got a little gray hair on it now. It's getting along. We're coming up on that time. Never before in history has that happened. But it has happened in your watch. Watch, watchman, watch. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?